So it is a joy to be with you this morning. Smed is uh, out of town this week. Him and Janet are uh, speaking at a, a conference, a young adults conference in Texas. So uh, next week we'll have our, our baptism Sunday, our membership Sunday. And then the week after that, Smed will be back in the book of Revelation in our verse by verse exposition of Revelation. But some, this morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 50. So please turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 50. Uh, Several weeks ago, Smed made a a comment as he was uh, teaching through the introduction to Revelation. He said said that the disciples, they missed something important about Jesus coming. He said they, they they were on board with Jesus as king. They embraced Jesus as the coming king. They knew that the Old Testament had promised a king that would sit on the throne of David. But what they missed, what they skipped over about the coming Messiah was that he would first, before he would be king, that he would be the suffering servant. And we could imagine why they would miss this. Why would they miss the the suffering of Christ? Well, Well, we can imagine in our flesh uh, just the desire for, for authority, for power, for a king. We want peace on this earth. We want justice and righteousness. We want to have a, a society with good laws. We, we all want a, a good ruler, a good king on the throne. But what we don't want, what the disciples didn't want, was suffering. They, they wanted the crown. They wanted the throne but they didn't want to, to suffer as they argue about who will be first, who will have the first place in this kingdom. And you know what, what Jesus says to all of his disciples. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is the path of Christ. It is the same path for us, a path of costly discipleship, of suffering, And we're entering in this country what seems like a a new season, a period of sifting in the church. A a period where where those who are Christians are going to have to make a a stand. They may actually have cost in this country to following Christ. There may be a, a significant cost. You may lose friendships. You may lose finances, careers. You may even lose security and freedoms, and maybe more than that. So we're going to need to put into our hearts again this morning is sustaining truths as we step into a world that's changing around us. And these truths, these commitments that we're going to see this morning come from the life of Christ himself. They come from the the commitments of Jesus as he walked this earth. We're going to see what sustained Christ on this earth. And we're not going to look at a a gospel this morning. We're going to see this in the, the message of Isaiah, in Isaiah 50. So Isaiah 50 is uh, in the middle uh, of this section in Isaiah called the servant songs. Servant songs, they're they're songs not because they're lyrical, but because they're poetic. These poetic elements of the coming Messiah. Isaiah has prophesied to this nation uh, during a Syrian invasion, during a Babylonia coming to them on their doorstep, and he has warned them. He has warned them of coming judgment because of their rebellion. And he has also given them a a promise of a a coming king, a coming Messiah who will reign. And then in chapter 42 of Isaiah, we are introduced to a a different aspect of this coming one, of this Messiah. He is called the the servant of the Lord. This one who will save God's people will, will be an exalted king, but first, a suffering servant. Isaiah 42 says that God delights in this servant, that the Spirit will anoint this one, that this servant comes to solve man's biggest problem. And we see in Isaiah that the Israelites have big problems, big physical, national problems. They have enemy nations on their doorstep. They, they need help, they need rescue. But more than that, they need spiritual rescue. They have unbelieving hearts. They have rebellious hearts. And this is the same problem that you and I have. This is the the same Savior that you and I need. And this Savior, this servant, comes not just as the Savior for God's people, but but the Savior for the whole world. Look at Isaiah. We'll we'll pick up Isaiah 49, verse 6. 
before we get to Isaiah 50. Just look at verse 6 of chapter 49. God says to the servant, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So this servant, the Messiah, will come and he will be a a savior not just for Israel, but for all mankind. And as you keep reading in chapter 49, you see the, the people of Israel, God's people, actually complain against the Lord. Look at verse 14 of chapter 49. But Zion, this is God's people in Jerusalem, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. They are complaining in the midst of a trial, in the midst of all these these hostile nations on their doorstep. They are saying, where are you, God? Why are you not here? They begin to doubt his word. They doubt his character. They doubt his promises. And once we get to Isaiah 50, we get the Lord's response to their disobedience. The the first three verses, the Lord responds to these accusations. God says that they are going into exile because of their sins in verse 1, because of their iniquities. Verse 2, he says he called to them. He called to save them, but they did not answer. They did not listen. They disobeyed. And then once you get to verse 4, You have not just God's response to their disobedience. You have the the servant himself, the Messiah, speaking. This is God's response to their disobedience, sending the servant. 600 years before Jesus came, this is the, the voice of Christ here. Prophetic voice of Christ. So let's read together. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 11. The Messiah says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting, for the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant? that walks in darkness and has no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Here in Isaiah 50, there is a a contrast On the one hand, you have the disobedient people of the Lord in the first three verses. And on the other, you have the obedient servant, the coming one, the Messiah, the one who is fully yielded to the will of his father. He perfectly obeys what God requires. And we see in this passage how this servant lived this perfect life. And if I were to ask you, how did Jesus, how was Jesus able to live a sinless life? You know, obvious theological answer, well, because he is God. He cannot sin. He is unable to sin. And that would be right. But here, what's in view is not his deity, but his humanity. What did Jesus the man do on this earth? How did he live his life? What did he trust in? Hebrews 2.17 says that he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. So he is fully God, fully man. Not giving up his divine attributes, but but putting a veil over his deity. You could say he restricted the use of his divine attributes so that he could identify with, with mankind. So in this passage, what's on display is the obedient life of Christ. Jesus as a man, a life of faith, a perfect life of faith. A man who is dependent on the Lord. 
So we're going to see the the convictions, the patterns of Jesus' life. And this will help us so we can have for ourselves a a model. This is what conviction looks like in the the face of hostility. So we're going to look at this morning three commitments for a resolute faith in a hostile world. Three commitments for a resolute faith in a hostile world. And these are the the commitments of Christ himself. The commitments of the, the Messiah who would come. First commitment here in verse 4 is ceaseless intake of the word of God. Ceaseless intake of the word of God. Verse 4 is uh, striking here. The Messiah comes on the scene and he says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples. At the end of verse 4, he says, He awakens my ear to learn as a disciple. We find out that the, the Messiah here is a learner. The word disciple in the New Testament means learner. The same idea here in Isaiah. One who is instructed. A student. In the ministry of Jesus, the Gospel of Luke says that that he was sent to proclaim good news. He was sent to preach a message of hope, a message of repentance. And here in Isaiah 50 verse 4, we see this proclamation ministry he, he speaks that he may know how to sustain the weary one with the word. He is proclaiming truth. He is proclaiming hope to the weary. Sustaining words. Jesus who said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. But this proclamation ministry, what he speaks, he first learned. He listened to the voice of God. He has a, a trained tongue. That's what it means when it says the tongue of disciples. It is a trained tongue. He is the speech of one who has been instructed on what to say. And he has a trained tongue because he has, it says, a listening ear. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. So as the Messiah carries out his earthly ministry, as he is preaching the good news, as he proclaims freedom and help, what's in view here is that he is the ultimate disciple, the, the best preacher. The ultimate preacher is the the ultimate learner, the ultimate disciple. And it doesn't say here that he speaks with kingly authority. That is true. He speaks with authority. It doesn't say here that he speaks prophetically. That is true as well. But here what's in view is him speaking as a disciple, as one who has been instructed. It says that he awakens me morning by morning. Morning by morning, he hears the voice of the Lord. The, the first thing he does in the morning, meditates on God's truth, listens. This is the, the ultimate Psalm 1 man, the one who meditates on God's word day and night. This was Jesus' practice as, as a 12-year-old boy. He is in the temple, immersed in God's truth. This is what he said during his temptation. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I heard a pastor recently say his, his personal motto is, no, no Bible, no breakfast. I'm not going to eat until I read the word. This is Jesus, the, the food, his food, his sustenance. What sustained him was God's word morning by morning. And he was not passive. He was not just on autopilot. He labored. He listens as a disciple. This is training. You think of the, the one rising up early in the morning, the, the young learner that's awakened by his teacher. Get up early to, to learn, to start your training. That's the idea here. So even the, the sinless one, Jesus without sin, considers it a, a privilege to meet with God, to read his word, to hear his voice. He, he didn't take days off. You think about us, we, we skip out, we get busy. I'm too busy, I have other more important things. This was Jesus' food, the Christ who would come. Think about his humility. He he is submitting here. He is listening. He is teachable. He is taking on human weakness, human limitations, so that he has to learn. And consider on the flip side, our our pride when we think we don't don't need God's truth, that we're self-sufficient. You know, passing glances at what God says. When the lamb, the spotless one here, is a student of what God says. And his confidence in God's word, this is a reflection of his, his faith in God's word, his trust. John Calvin calls 
faith, uh, the truth believed. If you trust God's word, if you trust the power of God's word, you, you will meditate on it. You will be bold to speak it to others. So he has confidence in the word of God. And this is the, the starting point here for Messiah as he deals with suffering, as he deals with the, the pain and the agony that awaits him, as he, as he looks forward toward the cross. He is a, first a student of what God says. Look at the end of verse four. It says, he awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. This word listen, this is the, the Hebrew word for obey. Deuteronomy 6, Shema, hear, O Israel, listen, O Israel, obey what God has said. As you read God's word, you know the will of God. It reveals what God prescribes, what he desires for his people. So the one who truly listens is the one who obeys, who does what God says. And that's what's in view next. Verse 5, it says, he was not disobedient to this instruction. That's going to bring us to our, our second commitment. Second commitment for a resolute faith in a hostile world. Complete submission to the will of God. Complete submission to the will of God. Jesus here perfectly obeys all that the Father requires. Perfectly submits to his will. I love what Pastor Jerry Ragg says. uh, The highest form of worship, he says, the highest form of worship is humble submission to the voice of God. This is Jesus' creed. This is what he says in John 6, 38. He says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 5, he says, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient. I did not turn back. He fully embraces what the Lord tells him. Think about obedience as a bending of the will, submitting your will to the will of God. This is why he is the servant. He is yielding to the purposes of his father. And Jesus' submission here is such a model for us in a world that rails against the idea of submission. Everyone wants to be autonomous. I don't want anyone to tell me what to do or how to act. We have Jesus the Messiah here being teachable, being submissive. He says, I did not turn back. And there is a specific instruction in view. Specifically, God's will for him, verse 6, was suffering. Verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike me. I gave my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. This was the father's plan. This was the plan for the servant. The servant bends his will to the the father's will towards suffering, torture, and eventually death. He is whipped and beaten. He says, I gave my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. Just think about the the hatred on display to, to rip out someone's beard. Once you get to Isaiah 53, it's no wonder that it says he was marred beyond recognition. He was unrecognizable as they're ripping out chunks of his face. I've had just, uh, you hold a baby. If you men that have a beard, you've probably experienced this. They grab onto your beard. A one-year-old, it hurts. Stop grabbing my beard. <laughs> Man, these are soldiers. This is Christ during his, his trial. A crown of thorns. Tearing out his hair like they would tear off a band-aid. Just think of the, the agony and the humiliation. In 2 Samuel 10, there's a story of David's army that's humiliated as they shave off part of their beard. It was a sign of respect. One quote that I found, it said, It is a custom among the Easterners, as well as the Greeks, and among all the nations, to cultivate the beard with the utmost care and solicitude, so that they regard it as the highest possible insult if a single hair of his beard is taken. So you have the, the physical pain and the contempt, the humiliation. And he goes on, he says, I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. He is slapped, he is beaten, he is spit upon. And just consider the, the visceral reaction. If someone hits you in the face, you know, the anger that would well up, the emotion, and, and no anger here by Christ, no, no retaliation. He is resolute, he is unfazed. They spit in his face. Just to, to spit in the presence of a king in the ancient Near East was an offense. It was contemptible. Just to spit in their presence. But this is spitting right in his face to say, you are worthless. You are less than dirt. I remember in the, back in 2020, in the, the COVID era, there was, uh, I just remember watching this video. 
And you can remember in that, in that season, like just to sneeze in public was an issue, right? If your kids are coughing, you're like, kids, stop, stop coughing in public. But I remember watching a video where someone was, was having this altercation and they, and they spit in someone's face just to prove their point. And just remember the, the, the horror, like just, the, just that kind of humiliation, that kind of disrespect. And Christ receives all of this willingly in humble submission. He gave his back. He gave his face. A total surrender to the Father's plan. The, the meekness on display here from Jesus. Uh, meekness is strength under pressure. He is not flexing his power. He is not bending others to, to meet his own demands. But he is submissive. Remember what he says to Pilate during his trial. He says to Pilate, he says, I, could, I can appeal to my father for 12 legions of angels. 70,000 angels could come at this moment if I wanted. But he doesn't do that. He is quiet. He is submissive to the will of the Father. And just compare that to us. How quick we are to, to manipulate, to try to bend other people to our will, to try to bend others to, to what we want. You know, as, as fathers, we can use our, our strength and our authority to, to have our kids meet our needs. I had a long day today. I just want to relax. I just want you to do what I want to do. Or moms, they, they want to raise their voice. I have a lot to do today. I have a big list of things. We can, we can bend our authority to get everyone to obey. And we get upset. We get so upset when people don't listen to us and they don't respect us. And here is Christ, reviled, hated, and he humbly offers his back. He doesn't turn away from the, the path before him. And what's amazing about this passage is that we have all of these same resources available to us. Right? We are not the, the sinless, the God-man. We don't have deity but what does he rely on? He, he lives a life of fervent prayer. Jesus prays. He meditates on God's word. He communes with God. He is led by God's spirit. He submits under God's will. And you read this account and you think, how could he suffer like that? And you might think, well, he is God. Yes, that's right. But again, that's not what's in view. Look at how he is able to suffer. Where does he turn to for strength? Verse 7. This is where he turns for strength. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. He is saying the, the Lord will come to my aid. Absolute confidence in the character of God. And that's the, the third commitment here. His third commitment for a resolute faith. Confident dependence on the character of God. Resolute in his, in his confidence. Trust in God's character. He will help me. He is mighty to save. He is saying, regardless of what insults I've received, regardless of what torture, beatings, spitting, mocking, flogging, I will still have confidence in the Lord. Therefore, I am not disgraced. They can rip out my beard, spit on my face, whip my back. Humiliation, but he says no disgrace because the Lord is on his side. Because he is pleasing to his father, it doesn't matter what man does to him. And with his confidence, he says, therefore I have set my face like flint. You see that in verse 7, I have set my face like flint. Flint, this, this stone, unbreakable stone, unmoving, impenetrable, firm, resolute. His face is fixed, physically, yes, as they beat him. As they spit upon him, he doesn't, he doesn't move his face. He yields to them. But, but more than that, his face is fixed in the sense that he is resolved. He is resolute in his purpose. He is unwavering. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke 9.51, Luke picks up this exact same phrase. In Luke 9.51, it says that he was determined, is how it reads in the, in the NASB, but what the, the literal reading is, he set his face toward Jerusalem, Luke 9.51. He set his face toward Jerusalem. I think this exact same phrase. He is determined to go to Jerusalem, not for the triumphal entry, but, but for the cross. Not toward Palm Sunday, but, but toward Good Friday. And this is exactly what he told his disciples. I must go to Jerusalem and be killed and be raised on the third day. So he set his face like flint in this direction. This purpose, a sacrificial death, 
And just consider the, the resolve of Christ toward obedience, toward the Father's will, and then, and then our resolve. You think about Peter. You know, Peter's resolve, I will never deny you. And then less than a day later, he, he is denying Christ. And that's what we do when things get hard. We self-protect. You know, how quickly can I get out of this situation? How quickly can I manipulate circumstances? Because I don't like how this feels. I'll do whatever it takes to get relief. And then you have this picture of Christ who is fixed, who is firmly fixed in his submission to the Father, unwavering obedience because of his confidence in the Lord. I will not be ashamed, he says. There is no shame as he confidently trusts in God's character. And in verse 8 and 9, it transitions to, to now a courtroom scene. Christ on trial, accused by adversaries, trusting in the vindication of the Lord. Look what it says in verse 8. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. He is saying, who can rightfully accuse me? This is, a, again, the idea of a, a courtroom. Someone standing next to him as if to, to make a case before a judge. And he says, who could accuse me? He says, I have no shame. I have no disobedience. There are no accusers. There, there's no one who will be able to make a case against him. Because the judge, the one who vindicates, he says, look what he says at the start of verse 8. The one who vindicates me is near. Or that is to say, he is with me. This is why no accusation can stand. This is why he has no shame. Insult, accusation, beating, whipping, mocking. But he says, God is near. He has confidence. God's presence is with him. God is with him in the midst of this suffering. The one who has all power and authority, the one who has the right to judge, he says, is by my side. And this was the complaint of the Israelites. We saw this in, in chapter 49, verse 14. When they complained, the Lord has forsaken us. They are saying, where is God? Why is he not near us? All the way back to the wilderness wanderings. This was the Israelites' complaint. They said, is the Lord among us or not? And now the servant, he is confident. He says, the Lord is by my side. And then in verse 9, the, the same refrain as verse 7. Behold, the Lord God helps me. That is his cry in the midst of suffering. The Lord God helps me. This is where his strength comes from. The only way to endure faithfully in a hostile world, to, to look to the, the character of God, to see him as a, a shield and a refuge. He says again, who, who is he who condemns me? This is to say, where are my accusers? This is the, the spotless lamb here, the, the perfect one. No fear of judgment because he has pleased the judge. And he goes on to say in verse 9, Behold, they all will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Uh, the moth, this reality in the Old Testament, it's still, still a reality today. If you leave your clothes in the storage unit, put them in the closet too long, bugs will eat your clothes. They will fall apart. They don't last forever. He is saying these accusers, any tyrant, anyone that opposes Christ, any ruler, any obstacle to the gospel, any human means of persecution to God's people, you have on one side eternal God, and on the other you have fragile, frail man, the ones who will be eaten by bugs, return to the dust. He says they will not stand. And just consider all of the, the accusers of Christ through the centuries. You read church history, and you have, you have just line after line of accusation against Christ. There is no resurrection. Christ was not a man. He did not exist. The Bible is just a book of myths. And all of these people, what happens to all of them? The ones who killed him, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans, all of the, the cults, the false religions, the heretics, false prophets, philosophers. They, they live and they die and God's word stands fixed. It remains. Christ still stands victorious. Every accusation fades away. He is vindicated by his father. So they have no accusation to make. And we need this reminder that God will vindicate. When we face wrongs, when we face injustices, 
if we face mistreatment, that God is the one who vindicates. God is the judge. You know, we are so tempted to say, it's not fair. That's not fair. And then you look at Christ, the only one who could say, it's not fair. And he said nothing. And he was innocent. We get so upset about wrongs committed to us. Us, us sinners, by fellow sinners, and the innocent one quietly submits to his father and trusts himself to the, the judge who will judge righteously. And what's so amazing about this courtroom scene in Isaiah 50, the servant appeals to his father to vindicate him. You keep reading Isaiah to the, the 53rd chapter, this apex of the, the servant songs here. You have the, the guiltless servant in Isaiah 50. No accusation can stand. The one whom the Father says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This servant who perfectly relied on his Father, perfect communion with God, loved by his Father. And then you turn to Isaiah 53. And look at verse 10 of chapter 53. The servant here in view. It says in verse 10 of 53. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. So Jesus, who never sinned, the one who was never angry, never had an impure thought, never rude, never unkind, never disobedient to parents, never lusted, never lied, never stole, perfectly in step with his Father's will. He could stand in the courtroom of heaven And say, where is my accuser? And his father, the one he appeals to, is now pleased to crush the son. He stands vindicated in heaven's courtroom. He's vindicated against all human accusations. And now he stands guilty. This same one who cried out, the Lord is my help. Behold, the Lord God is my help, he cries out. He is the same one who cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, the judge who stood at his side in Isaiah 50 now stands against him. And this is the, the great exchange of the gospel. It says the Lord was pleased to crush him, but not for his own sin, but for the sin of his people. Look at the next verse, at the end of verse 11. He says the righteous one, My servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. The servant, his face fixed like flint toward the cross. He hangs between heaven and earth, crushed by his father, so that the many, his people would be declared righteous. So so now that his people can stand in heaven's courtroom and they can say, where is my accuser? Or as Paul says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is Christ Jesus who died. Who could condemn? Now this is the the message of salvation. This is the gospel message that this servant died in the place of sinners. That that we who trust in him can have the very righteousness of Christ. the, The righteousness that we desperately need. And he takes on the cross our sin that we can be declared righteous because we've been covered in the blood of the lamb who was slain. And now in Isaiah 50, you have a, a transition. The last two verses, Isaiah 50, verses 10 and 11. You have a, a built-in application in this passage. Verses 10 and 11 ask, basically, now what do you do with this servant? What will you do? in response to what he has done. And there are two groups of people in verses 10 and 11. Always, only, ever, are there two groups of people. There's only two groups. In this room, there are only two groups. And this is the dividing line for all humanity. What do you do with the person of Jesus Christ? How do you respond to him? Verse 10, you have those that embrace him by faith. They embrace by faith God's plan of salvation. They embrace by faith his servant. In verse 11, you have those who continue to trust in themselves. 
in contrary to what the world says, not, not all paths lead to, to the same goal. Not all paths are right. Everyone doesn't get to have their own truth. There, there is only one truth. There, there's no middle ground in the Bible. There is light and there is darkness. There is life and death. And this is why there is hostility. This is why there's hostility against the gospel message and against followers of Christ because we proclaim an exclusive message, a message that offends human self-righteousness. Jesus, when he comes on the scene, his first words in his public ministry, repent, turn away from everything you've made of yourself. You must fundamentally change. And we live in a world that wants to be applauded for self-love. They want to be applauded for their own ingenuity and brilliance. In a world that says, this is just my identity. This is just who I am. And the Bible says, no, you have made choices. You are accountable for your choices. You are guilty because of your choices. That is an offensive message. Our culture, it hates the message. You have to submit to Christ. You have to submit to this one who has all authority. A message that requires you admit that not only are you wrong, that you are, you are offensive, you are rebellious against a holy God that you need a substitute. This is a a hostile message. And there are only two responses. We see the the two responses here to to this Messiah. Verse 10, the, the positive response. This first group, he says, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant? This first group, those who who fear God, those who obey the, the voice of the Messiah, This is the the definition of a a believer, one that trusts and obeys God. Fear of the Lord. This is an Old Testament phrase for saving faith. One who trusts God's character, who trusts God's judgment, who sees him as as both the the judge and and the vindicator, the one who is sovereign. This is a, a phrase of submission, to fear the Lord. But he narrows it in here. Those who fear the Lord are the same ones who listen to the voice of his servant. All of those who are are followers of God from the heart, who have a right fear of the Lord, they also listen to the voice of the servant. To to listen again is to obey. That is the right response here to the servant. The only response, to treat this servant, the Messiah, with the the right authority, the rightful authority that he has. He he puts the servant on equal plane with God here. He says, you must obey this one. This one is deserving of our obedience. When God speaks, he speaks. This is what God the Father says on the the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, this is my beloved Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. So this first group, those who respond rightly to the servant are those that fear God, that obey the servant. And he gives one more description in verse 10. Those that walk in darkness and they have no light. So those that have this genuine faith They find themselves in darkness. They find themselves surrounded in difficulty, in suffering, in trials, discouragements, disappointments. I remember uh, after becoming a new believer, maybe maybe a lot of you have had this experience. You think, like, I'm just always going to have this zeal. Man, the Christian life is just going to be easy. I'm going to be excited. I'm going to be enthusiastic. I may never sin again. This is going to be great. And And then all of a sudden, life comes at you and your flesh comes at you discouragements come at you. You hit roadblocks. You see your own sin and your failings, your weakness. You sit in darkness. And that might be you this morning, sitting in darkness, discouraged maybe, feeling the the weight of life, feeling like you can't see, situations that won't change, relationships that won't get better, health issues with no resolution, But he says here, there is hope for that one. Not not necessarily relief, not necessarily an easy life, not even physical comfort, but there is direction. There is a a path. There is a path without fear. There is someone who will walk with you in this darkness, who will be by your side. He's saying, don't look to your own resources to find your way out. Verse 10, let him trust 
in the name of the Lord his God. And let him rely on his God. The the name of the Lord, that is God's character. Everything that God has revealed himself to be. Trust that God keeps his promises. Trust that he is mighty to save. Trust that he is a shield. That he is a refuge. Trust in that servant. the, The suffering one. Rely on God. Uh, about a month ago, we were in, uh, in Florida at a, at a conference uh, for the seminary. The seminary puts on a conference every year called Courageous Churchmen. And uh, there was a young man that, as part of the seminary in, in uh, Houston, came out to the, the conference. And the first night, he actually had a seizure. Out of nowhere, 23-year-old, healthy young man. And it uh, turns out they, they, they think, and I haven't heard an update, but they think he has a, a brain tumor. 23 years old, out of nowhere, lying on the floor bleeding with a, with a seizure. And I'll never forget what his pastor said. His pastor gave us an update. And this young man had grown up in the church. He's in seminary. He's been reading his Bible. He's heard so much truth. And he said now he gets to, to take, with the eyes of faith, he gets to take hold of all of these truths that he's heard. And he gets to, to rely on God. He gets to embrace by faith what he knows to be true in the midst of darkness, to rely on God. And there is a, another group, though, in view here. Verse 11, the, the other response to the Messiah, the, the wide path, the many. Look at verse 11. All you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands. This second group, they also find themselves in darkness. They also find themselves needing light. They are are facing difficulty, hardness in life, and they are determined not to walk in darkness. They kindle their own fire. It says they try to light their own path. They light these firebrands. This word is, it's like sparks, not like a torch, not something that you could actually see with, but sparks. The idea of of a blacksmith beating his anvil and you just see sparks come off. Using this stick with a dimly lit spark not even being able to to emanate light. You can't light your way with that. But they say, no, we're going to attach these things to ourselves. We're going to surround ourselves with these sparks. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to find my own light. You see the self-determination here. He encircles himself with these lights. Self-reliance is on display. He has no light, but he turns inward. I'm going to solve problems on my own. Uh, enamored here with his own abilities, his own strength, his own resources, his own morality, his own creativity. This is every, every false religion is like this. I'm going to get to God on my own strength, on my own resources, my own ingenuity. I am the determiner of my own fate. And that's the issue here. You can't have those things and have Christ. You can't submit to your own authority, be your own king, love your own pleasure, and have Christ as your king. Look at how Christ responds to those who rejected him. He responds. He says now in verse 11, walk. Walk in the light of your fire and the brands that you have set ablaze. Go ahead and walk with this this light, these sparks. Go ahead and live according to your own strength, according to your own wisdom. He he gives them over to themselves. And he says, this you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. If you reject Christ, if you trust in your own goodness, in your own strength, if you you do not submit to, to the reigning King Jesus, this is what he says he has for you. His strength, his mighty arm here that is used to signify his power. In verse 2, it talks about his arm being the one that that causes light in darkness, the sun to rise, that is powerful over all the elements of the earth. That mighty arm, that great strength will be against you. He is saying God is not indifferent. God is not indifferent to this rejection. He is not ignoring those who reject his Messiah. He says, this you will have from my hand, out of the abundance of my mighty strength, you will lie down in torment. Those who who looked for rest and comfort 
in themselves, who do whatever they can do to find fulfillment, whatever earthly comfort they can get, try to maximize this life. He says, when you finally lie down, when you finally stop to rest, you will find no rest. You will only find torment, no relief. In both of these groups, they find themselves in darkness. On the one hand, the response is self-trust. The other, confidence in God. And we have in this passage a model for us, Christ himself. A model of a life of dependent, humble faith in the midst of hostility, in the midst of suffering and sorrow and pain. He he treasures God's word. He is devoted to God's will. He relies on the the character of God. I want you to listen as I read in closing here. I just want to read 1 Peter chapter 2, just the last several verses. 1 Peter just captures this idea so well. 1 Peter chapter 2. Just listen as I read. Peter writes, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds we are healed. For you were continually straying like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Would you pray with me? Jesus, uh, I pray that you would give us eyes of faith to, to fix our eyes on you, the one who endured the cross, the one who is our, our faithful high priest, uh, an example for us, but so much more than an example, Jesus, our substitute. So I pray that we would fix our eyes on you this week in the midst of trials, in the midst of discouragements, I pray that you would be near us. I pray that you would walk with us in those things. I pray that we would look to your character. I pray that we would look to your word. I pray that we would have confidence in your power. And I pray that this church, as we do those things, would be a testimony to your gospel. We would be a light to the world around us of your grace and your kindness so that you would draw many to yourself, that you would make a great name for yourself, Jesus. For all these things in your name. Amen.